I'm Natasha Kierczuk, and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, new details about a White House leak to Russia puts Israel in the hot seat. The Israeli government decides to follow through with cutting power to the Gaza Strip. And women, make sure you're listening because a new Israeli study could massively change the way you deal with pregnancy. Stay tuned for the latest news in Israel. It's been weeks since Israeli Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman essentially confirmed that U.S. President Donald Trump leaked Israeli intelligence to the Russians. And now new reports are saying that Israel got the intelligence the old-fashioned way, through computer hacking. Israeli cyber operators were able to hack into the network of Islamic State bomb makers in Syria, according to the New York Times. Once inside, they managed to gather intel about an ISIS plot to make explosives that look identical to laptop batteries and could get through airport X-ray machines. Apparently, this was part of the classified intelligence that Trump passed on to Russian officials in a meeting at the White House last month. While Israeli security personnel were furious over the leak, by all accounts, intelligence cooperation between the two countries is proceeding normally. Israel's success, which led to the U.S. ban on laptops on flights from European and Middle Eastern countries, is one of the few victories in the cyber war against ISIS. The former senior director for counterterrorism at the National Security Council has told The Times that there is a sense of disappointment in the overall ability for cyber operations to land a major blow against ISIS. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says that a UN agency is getting in the way of peace and he's told Nikki Haley that it's time to dismantle it. Netanyahu is claiming that UNRWA, the UN agency that serves Palestinian refugees, is acting as an obstacle to peace. UNRWA בנידרבה, בעצם קיומה, וגם לצערי בפעולתה מעת לעת, מנציחה את בעיית הפליטים הפלסטינים ולא פותרת אותה. ולכן הגיע הזמן לפרק את UNRWA. ולמזג את החלקים שלה בנציבות הפליטים העליונה של האו"ם. Haley's pro-Israel record in the UN and promises to work against UN bias are perhaps giving Netanyahu hope that she'll push for ending UNRWA. While Haley was visiting Israel, a terror tunnel was discovered under a UNRWA school in the Gaza Strip. בשבוע שעבר פגשתי גם את שגרירת ארצות הברית באו"ם, ניקי Haley. אני הודעתי לה גם בשמכם. על דבריה התקיפים לטובת מדינת ישראל ונגד האובססיה האנטי-ישראלית באו"ם. אמרתי לה גם שהגיע הזמן שהאו"ם יבחן את המשך קיומו של אונר"א. חמאס is denying that they built the tunnel or that any other Gaza terror group did, which raises questions about how it got there. אנחנו נסתנקר בשדה מה ג'אה פי ביין אונר"א מלדעת, בין הונאק נפק أسفل إحدى المدارس وسط قطاع غزة مما قد يشكل خطر هذه الادعاءات على أبناء شعبنا الفلسطيني وقد تستغل مثل هذه التصريحات من قبل العدو الإسرائيلي لقتل المدنيين واستهداف المدارس The U.S. ambassador to the U.N. got a taste of authentic Israeli culture at the Lebanese border on Thursday after a spat broke out between the IDF and the U.N. Haley got to watch the Israeli Defense Force Deputy Chief of Staff Major General Avi Kochavi get into a spirited argument with UNIFIL Commander Michael Berry over what Berry claims is a stable situation in southern Lebanon. Berry was briefing Haley on the UN mission on South Lebanon claiming that UNIFIL was successful. The border was stable and the situation did not require further intervention. This provoked Kochavi who interrupted Berry to tell Haley that on the contrary UNIFIL is not doing its job and is a afraid of entering Hezbollah-controlled villages and cities in South Lebanon. Kochavi says that UNIFIL is failing in its mission of disarming Hezbollah. Since the 2006 Lebanon war, Hezbollah has built up its weapons stockpile. It now has around 150,000 short, medium, and long-range missiles, mostly from its patron, the Islamic Republic of Iran. A diplomat has apologized to Haley for Kochavi's outburst, but she's reportedly saying she's glad she got to see the reality of the Israeli side and that it will influence her work at the United Nations. 
It looks like the residents of Gaza are going to have to get used to even less electricity now since Israel is reportedly going to meet the demands of Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas and cut power to the coastal enclave. ILTV's Aaron Porras has more on the story. Aaron, why do this? Well, I mean, it's not like this was a really simple decision for the Israelis either, to be honest. You know, on the one hand, while putting pressure on Hamas is within Israeli interests, uh, there are a lot of concerns that further reducing the electricity and, and the humanitarian crisis in Gaza, or rather adding to the humanitarian crisis in Gaza, could cause chaos. So it's, at the moment, they're trying to kind of wait and see. They're in a wait and see sort of position. Well, let's check out your report. Right. right now, there's only power to Gaza for about six hours a day. Now that the Palestinian Authority will pay $7 million a month for electricity for Gaza instead of around 11, it'll be more like three to four hours a day. Kogat head Yoav Mordechai is concerned about an escalation with Hamas as well, but according to officials, still favors adopting a policy in line with Abbas's. Energy Minister Yuval Steinitz, however, has been pushing back. He's concerned about the optics. What if it looks like Israel is taking orders from the PA? For now, though, Israel is ignoring such hypotheticals and going along with Abbas. Prime Minister Netanyahu is getting extra blowback right now for proposing legislation that would limit an NGO's ability to fight on behalf of Palestinians. ILTV's Aaron Boris is still here and he has more on the story. That's Aaron, true. what is going on? Well, the, uh, the bill would limit the ability of NGOs to defend Palestinians under certain circumstances by making it so that you would have to have been directly affected by whatever it is that you're legally fighting in order to be present you know, and, uh, and battling on that side. So it makes it really impossible for certain NGOs to then come to the defense and the, and the legal aid of, of Palestinians when they themselves, the NGO speaking, was not affected. Interesting. All right, let's check out that report. Netanyahu declared his intention to support the bill proposed by Likud MK Miki Zohar during his weekly coalition meeting. If passed, the bill would only allow individuals directly affected by the particular state action to appeal to the high court. As the law currently stands, NGOs are currently allowed to appeal against any regulatory agencies or any Israeli policies governing the occupied territories, even if the plaintiffs are not directly affected by said policies. Attorney General Avichai Mandelbit has come out against the proposed legislation, saying that the bill would harm the Supreme Court and the rule of law, especially in difficult cases and, quote, in cases involving weaker populations, end quote. Joining us today in the studio to discuss Education Minister Naftali Bennett's push for a new code of ethics for Israeli universities is Eitan Meir. Eitan is a director of development and external relations at Imtirtu, an Israeli organization that works to fight BDS in Israel and has been cited as a strong motivator in crafting the new code of ethics. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. All right, so let's start with Im Tiltu and its role in drafting this code. What role did it exactly play in drafting the code? So we're very proud to say that Im Tiltu played a major role in drafting this. For years, this has really been a focal point of our activity, is really promoting and exposing all the stuff that's go that goes on in Israeli academia. So why don't you kind of give us a, a quick um, summary of what the code entails? Sure, the, the code basically wants to, wants to separate political activity and academia, and rightfully so. It says that political that any political expressions that the professors make should be in the confines of the class. There shouldn't just be random remarks that, you know, the IDF, they kill children, they do this, blah, blah, which has happened, and we've seen it happen over and over again. It says that political program, academic programs, that as, for example, now in Hebrew U, there's actually an academic program that gives you a scholarship, it gives students scholarship and academic credits for volunteering in organizations like B'Tselem, like Hamoked, which is a NGO that defends now, terrorists. Now, why, why, I mean, why do you believe that this code of ethics is needed? Again, we've, in addition to all the reports that we published over the years, stuff really, uh, professors promoting BDS, legal clinics in Haifa that are actually defended terrorists who murdered Israelis in court. We've received hundreds and hundreds of complaints over the years from students who've basically told us, listen, we're sitting in the class, we're getting one view of the conversation, we're scared. We know that if we talk out, the professor is going to yell at us. We know that he's going to give us a bad grade. When we're writing papers, when we wrote about a Zionist subject, we were giving remarks off, and this has happened, and we know this has happened. People ask us, what is the need for this? Well, I, I mean, I remember when I was in college, I dealt with mm -hmm. that. I sometimes had professors who didn't necessarily preach points of views that I agreed with personally. But mm -hmm. I mean, wouldn't you say, in a, in a sense, this is a type of academic censorship of sorts? Because at the same time, you do want to be exposed to a range of ideas, whether or not you agree with them. Exactly. And that's what the code actually promotes. It says that a professor has the obligation to 
give both sides of the story. For example, I professors, to this day, I don't even know if they were left wing or right wing. Why? There was a controversial subject and they said, okay, I'm, pro I'm providing this point of view and that point of view. And they said it. They didn't give the personal opinion. There was a really a vibrant academic debate and it was great. There was no need for them to, you know, throw in their own remarks about, oh, by the way, you know, I think the IDF kills children and I think that Israel's an apartheid state. People ask, why, why do we need this? And it's really simple. When you have professors, let's say, in Ben Gurion University, who for his mandatory class of 200 people invites activists of breaking the silence, tells the students they have to come to class, it's mandatory. They can't film it, they can't ask questions, they don't bring anyone from the other side, that's politicization. When you have professors that promote the BDS movement and they say that in their classes, that's politicization. When you have, again, like I said, academic programs that allow you to volunteer in radical organizations, that's politicization. Even last year in Ben Gurion University, ben -Gurion University the Department for Middle Eastern Studies, they unanimously voted to present a prize to breaking the silence of 20,000 check, a human rights prize. Now, you ask yourself, this is supposed to be a department, it's supposed to be a place of pluralism, of a place of, that you could express different opinions. How is it possible that a whole entire department of over 20 professors provided, gave a prize to the most controversial organization in Israel? Now, you know, the Committee of University Heads and the National Union of Israeli Students have come out against this new ethics code. Why is that? Honestly, I, I can't speak for them. All I know it's very unfortunate because if they actually read the code, and you, you've heard a lot of talk shows in, in Israel and people saying, I didn't actually read the code, but blah, blah, blah. If we would actually read the code, you would understand that this is for the students. It's not for the professor. The professors We'd are from the point of strength. We'd also be the only Western country with this type of code of ethics, though, right? I mean, that... Uh, no, in, in America, there's also a code of ethics that's very okay. similar to this. And, and again, universities are... In but isn't 2000, that voluntarily? I mean, that's... What? And, and in, in 14, 2010, the Council for Higher Education in Israel, they came out with a decision that political activity in the university should be discouraged. And it was supposed to be the universities that were supposed to be the ones to enforce it. Seven years later, that hasn't happened. Ben Gurion University, for example, I keep on repeating Ben Gurion University because unfortunately there's been a lot of circumstances there. They have an academic, they have a code as like this, but the professor that drafted it, Yanai Navo, he said on his, in the Facebook post two months ago that he's pro BDS. Now, I, why not just use the existing code of ethics that's been adopted by Ben Gurion University, which prohibits lecturers from endorsing political parties. Because it, it doesn't work. Ben Gurion University is the perfect example of a place that, is, that as a, the social sciences, the departments usually, that is just rampant anti-Zionism. You have professors there that are just not allowing students to express their opinions, and they're not expressing both points of the conversation. That's what we want. We want for pluralism. We want for the professors to get there and say, listen, there's two points of every story. Here's point A, here's point B, discuss. And there's no reason that that is any sort of censorship, censorship it, there's no reason that it stifles free speech. It's the opposite. It allows for students to actually speak and speak their mind, and allows for academic growth. So I, I have one last question, kind of to my only question so far, anyway, to, <laughs> to kind of follow that is how how do you then prove that, and then how what are the steps that follow that? So that's actually something that's in the report that's not so clear. There is supposed to be a mechanism that's going to enforce it, and it's supposed to be the universities that are supposed to enforce it themselves. As of now, it's not clear that if a student complains and this university is supposed to look into it, it's not actually clear what's going to happen after that. Mm. And we're, we're, we're really supporting, you know, Naftali Bennett, the Minister Bennett, as well as Professor Asa Kasher, who is the author of the IDF Code of Conduct, and he drafted this. Asa Kasher is not a right-wing guy. He is not a right-wing guy at all. He's a left-wing guy, and the fact that people are attacking him just shows the fact that they're so entrenched in their own views they can't even open to understand there is a problem in academia. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but Thanks it was interesting to, to learn about this new ethic, of co this code of ethic. There we mm -hmm. go. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. The recent terrorist attack on the Iranian parliament has shocked the world, and even though ISIS is claiming responsibility, the Iranians are focusing their blame elsewhere, and it happens to be on the United States and Israel. Last Wednesday, 10 people were shot dead by multiple gunmen at the Iranian parliament building. Another person was simultaneously killed at the mausoleum of Ayatollah Khomeini, the leader of the Islamic Revolution. The attacks have led to a war of words between the United States and Iran. President Donald Trump is saying that Iran bears responsibility for the attack, seeing it as a blowback for its sponsorship of terrorism across the Middle East. Iranians are pointing the finger for the attacks at the West. ما تردیدی نداریم که تر راه اصلی این توطعه ها آمریکای جنایتکار است. Iran is claiming that the attacks were greenlit by the United States and Saudi Arabia. The Islamic Republic also sees an American hand in the recent Sunni split with their ally of Qatar. Israeli firefighters are up in arms about their new uniforms because they have a fatal flaw. They're flammable. 
And no, we're not kidding. The firefighters began protesting this weekend, according to Army Radio, by discarding their new polyester shirts and wearing nothing but their undergarments and pants. The chairman of the Firefighters Workers Union says that a human resources official of the Israel Fire and Rescue Service is trying to save money by providing firefighters with inappropriate and unsafe fire trap uniforms. He says the fire commissioner's office has wasted millions of shekels on flammable polyester pants and tried to save face by claiming they were only for spotters and volunteers after firefighters refused to wear them. The Fire and Rescue Service claims that the protest is merely part of a power struggle with the union and that the union is not accurately describing the situation. According to one of their representatives, the union is engaged in strange and pathetic muscle flexing. For the Israeli Navy soldiers who were up to their chests in flood water this week trying to plug holes in a ship with pieces of rope and wood, there was only one consolation. It was just a simulation. On Thursday, three soldiers got together for the Jewish Telegraph Agency to simulate what it's like to rescue a sinking vessel. For over 15 minutes, they fought off all of the water rushing into a flooding simulator at the Navy training base in Haifa. Navy sailors go into a simulator that replicates the experience of a sinking ship several times during basic training. And the first time they try it out is in the middle of the night so that they're forced to deal with the added stress and pressure from exhaustion. It's especially important for naval soldiers to develop good camaraderie since they're crammed into small boats and submarines for weeks at a time. The flooding simulator takes place inside of a steel tower full of pipes and holes that can pump in water where the new seamen are put to the test. But even the best soldiers can't always keep out the water. The main goal is to buy as much time as possible because the extra time can make the difference between a timely rescue and a watery grave. All right, I don't know about you, but one of my favorite things about my smartphone is that I can play games on it. Yes, I admit it, I'm a cell phone gamer, which is why I am very happy to say that Mohamed Bushnak is joining us in the studio today. He's a co-founder of Obscure Games, whose game League of Guessing has already been downloaded over three million times. Thank you so much for joining us, and I'm so excited to have you here because this is the first time that we've had a gamer in our studio. Thank you very much. So tell us, why, what made you start developing video games? What was your, you know, I mean, how did this start? So at first it started because I'm a hardcore gamer. I play a lot of games, like okay. for, for, for five or six, six years. And then uh, I decided to, to, to start this as a hobby and I didn't study anything in university yet. So I, I scrolled through YouTube, how to develop games, how to make games. So you started this before you had gone to university? At I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't study in university yet. So okay, maybe we'll see. You may not need to if you're yeah. having so much success, right? <laughs> so interesting. So you started developing these games obviously before you had been trained as to how to do this. You just kind of figured yeah, it out on your own. Yeah, on my own. I just went through YouTube and started like uh, learning by myself and uh, like testing things out. And the first game that I created is Mario. Mario. Like yeah, I'm, I'm creating a clone of Mario to to practice a little bit. Okay. And uh, ah, the, it's amazing the power of the internet. You can literally yeah, learn, you can anything, learn anything, right? I mean, you went to YouTube and you figured how to do this, and you created a game already um, that has already been downloaded three, three million, million times. That's yes. crazy. And so, what is the game? I mean, how? I'm just wondering, kind of like, what the thought process is that you go through when you're creating a game. What are you inspired by? Um, I get inspired, for example, for uh, trending games. For example something getting very popular popular now and mm -hmm. it's trending like um, like you know when you remember when uh, when united airlines uh, uh, pushed that guy from the airplane yeah and then you think like everyone is like uh, uh, searching for that kind of uh, thing and it's now trending and you can so create... So what is it like revenge against United Airlines? Yeah, and then you uh, can employees? create a, a simple idea about, about it. So you need, you have to right. wait for the right time. It's because true, I do remember those games with politicians like bobbleheads and things like that. So yeah, so it's kind of looking at, looking to the mainstream media to see what people are thinking about yes. and then creating a game around that. That's really interesting. And so these are all games that you've created, the yes. ones that we're seeing on the screens here. Right. So. I mean, what can you tell us about your latest game? So the last game that I'm working on now, um, it's a big project. Uh, it's called Mobile Mobile Revolution. Okay. You can see it on the on the screen, okay. and uh, it's it's talking. It's uh, it's a simple game, a writing game for music, 
where you can listen to music and play at the same time with one finger. Like you can swipe left, right, up and down. And uh, so gonna, you can keep your own soundtrack going, essentially. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's uh, I'm I'm working now with uh, um, with my th three of my friends on this project. Uh, it's gonna be so big. So it's gonna take like uh, five to six months to like to, to until you launch it, until yes. you actually launch it. Wow, that's amazing. Now this is kind of a fun industry to be a part of. I bet you have a lot of fun doing this. I mean, it requires being very creative. Yes. And where are you from in Israel? I'm from Kfamanda. That's uh, in the in, in the north. In the uh, north. Okay. Near uh, Nazareth. Wow, okay, so you came all the way down to Tel Aviv. Well, this is really interesting. I guess the big question is, after this launch, what's next? What's next? You have to search for publishers, you have to search for uh, fundraising because you need money for this right. uh, big project. Uh, I've been uh, in, uh, in two places, in Tel Aviv for Casual Connect and in Prague, and one more place in Germany, Gamescom. They're all uh, uh, conferences related to games where you can go and show your, your game and you're going to talk about it and you ask for money. There you go. And I mean, listen, I think people spend so much time on their phones now that this is really the, the path to go down because I know I love, uh, you know, wasting my time by playing games. You probably don't call it wasting time. No, it's not wasting. It's not wasting time. <laughs> it's having fun. But it's really, really cool what you're doing. Congratulations on the success you've had so far and thank you for coming in. Thank you very much. All right, the last thing a pregnant woman wants to hear is to stop being so nervous and just calm down. But a new Israeli study is suggesting that stress during pregnancy can leave the offspring with eating disorders. According to scientists at Israel's Weizmann Institute of Science, research on pregnant mice found a causal link between prenatal stress and binge eating disorders. Apparently, stress signals to the embryo that it will enter an environment with poor food availability, pushing it to slow its metabolism. When a child with such prenatal programming is born into a culture with food abundance, he or she can be prone to binging on high-calorie foods. The good news is that the scientists have also found a solution. A diet high in folic acid and B vitamins can counteract the onset of compulsive eating disorders, at least in mice. It sounds like pregnant women should follow the example of Popeye and eat their spinach. It looks like the Middle East is taking center stage once again, only this time at the 71st Tony Awards. ILTV's Aaron Porras is back in the studio and he's been following this very, very closely, oh, haven't yeah. you? Super, super, super closely. It's a big deal. So the oh, yeah. Middle East peace process was highlighted at the Tony Awards. Tell Absolutely, us. yeah. We have, we have the story of the Middle East peace process that culminated in the, in the Oslo Accords being told on Broadway by the, sh by the play uh, called Oslo. And it is centered around two Norwegian diplomats, uh, the uh, Mona Jewell and her husband, wow. who, using any methods necessary, you know, at their at their disposal at the time, were able to pull together the the peace accords. Right, it's, really it's all about incredible. their quiet heroics behind mm -hmm. the peace accords, and they they created a Broadway play oh, about yeah. this, and now and it won best play at the Tony crazy. Awards. So, it's incredible. All so right, let's, well, yeah, let's, let's check out my report. report. A play inspired by the Israeli-Palestinian peace process has just been crowned best play on New York's Broadway. The play called Oslo focuses on the Norwegian diplomats behind the 1993 Oslo Accords, following the unlikely friendships that led to the agreement over two decades ago. It looks like the play was such a success that Hollywood movie adaptation is in the works, and it's reportedly being planned by Mark Platt, the producer of the hit movie La La Land, which won six Oscars this year. Michael Aronov also won a Tony for Best Featured Actor for his portrayal of an Israeli diplomat in the play, and that's not all. Everyone's favorite Jewish actress, Bette Midler, took home her first competitive Tony for Best Actress in the musical, Hello, Dolly. Enroll in eTeacher's online Hebrew courses and quickly discover that it creates the deepest connection to Israel that you could ever imagine. And now for our Hebrew word of the day. The top news of the day is all about information leaks that wound up in questionable hands. So today's word is nezila, meaning a leak. Normally a nezila refers specifically to a runny nose or a cold. The only difference between an information nezila and a nose nezila is that one is less permanent and sticky, while the other is typically more annoying, if not dangerous. Anyway, now is usually a time where I give you some sort of advice related to our word, but today I'll just keep it to myself. You won't be getting a nezila from me. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight will be partly cloudy with a low of 70 or 21 degrees Celsius. Tomorrow you can expect no significant changes with a high of 83 or 28 degrees. And that's about it. 
All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.53 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV. I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for watching.